Hello everybody, Miss Barato here and welcome to the very first episode ever of Composer Tea. I have Kitty as my co-host and today for my tea I have a ginger turmeric herbal blend. I thought it'd go best with honey. Today I wanted to talk about Igor Stravinsky. And Igor Stravinsky, he was born in 1882, and he was one of the most important composers of the 20th century. He was born like right outside of Russia. He was born in Finland, in like this little town in Finland that was like 25 miles away from Russia, like St. Petersburg, Russia. So like, he was Russian, but he wasn't Russian. But I think he identified as it. I think he worked there a lot. I don't know. That's what I know. I would say he is most famous for his ballet music. So some of those pieces are Firebird, there is Petrushka. I don't know if I'm ever saying that right when I say it. We're gonna roll with it. And also Rite of Spring. Um, but we'll get into Rite of Spring a little later. So his dad was a singer and his mom was a pianist and they taught him how to play piano where he took lessons and he grew up and he was yeah he was doing well on piano but his parents didn't want him to become a musician like they were look at your little toes sorry <laughs> distractions they didn't want him to go into music because like they were musicians they were like no we really want you to get into law and politics and bureaucracy and stuff yeah. he was like okay i'll go study law so he's studying law and when apparently the school he went to it was like you don't have to come to class you just have to kind of turn in the work and he like never went to class i don't think he was that into it well then while he was in school his dad died and he was like, you know what? I'm uh, not gonna do this anymore. I don't wanna do this. So he decided I'm not gonna go into law. I'm gonna study music. And he was like really getting into that at the time anyways. So he studied with Rimsky Korsakov, who was another really famous composer. And that was the only formal training he had was just like these one-on-one -on -one lessons he had with Rimsky Korsakov which is pretty amazing. So if you look at now, in more recent times, if you're going to be a musician or some famous composer, you're going to school for it. You have a bachelor's and a master's degree in composition. You have to go to school. But then, like he didn't have to do these things. So he just literally took the piano lessons so he could play piano and then he studied composition with Rimsky Korsakov, and that's all he had. So it's actually kind of amazing that he composed all of these things that he did. It's really amazing, actually. Later, after this happened, he also uh, married <laughs> one of his first cousins, and they had four children together. Because even then, at the time he was alive when he got married, it was it was frowned upon to marry your cousin. Still probably shouldn't marry your cousin. So they found a, like in the next village over, they found like a village priest who didn't know them. And they were like, oh yeah, totally. We're not related, not related like at all. And so they lied to this priest and this priest married them. He was like, yeah, totally. Two young people, like let's get married. Whoa, that worked don't do that. So that was a thing. So I want to talk about some of his compositions and in particular I would like to talk about the Rite of Spring, one of these ballets. Stravinsky was the only composer in history whose music started a full-on riot during the performance. So the premiere, the first showing of this performance, like it went down. Let's talk a little bit about Rite of Spring, like what is the Rite of Spring? So Rite of Spring is a ballet and basically I'll go on into like what happens in this ballet. 
it's basically about pagan Russia. So it's like a barbaric version of Russia. That's the best way I can put that for you. And it's a two-part ballet. So in the first part, it's called Adoration of the Earth. And the second part is called The Sacrifice. So I can, you can already imagine what happens in the second part. And uh, basically, here's what happens. So let's talk about part one first. So I'm looking at my notes too, so I don't miss a part of the story. So if you're like, why does she keep looking here? It's because I... I want to make sure I get it right. So here's what happens. Basically, it's called the Rite of Spring. So basically, spring is here, just like right now. So it's like there's really cool opening and there's a bassoon playing. It's like really high register and spring is here. Cool. Well, an old woman comes out and she begins to tell the future of like, this is going to happen. Okay, whatever. And then there's some young girls that come from the river and they start dancing and then there's people who come and watch them dancing and then eventually these people divide into two groups. So like there's rival tribes happening here and they're in opposition to each other. And then in comes these wise elders and they come in and they stop everything and they're like, no, you all need to bless the earth. And then the people all come together. They're like, you're right, wise people. And they dance and so that they're one with the earth. And they're dancing because, well, this is a ballet after all. That's, that's what you do in a ballet. You dance. Also remember, because it's a ballet, they're not talking. They're expressing all of this through movement, through dance. So you kind of have to know the story. And if you were looking at a program in the concert, it would probably say that a little bit too to help the audience member. So that's why I'm telling you this. That's basically what happens in part one. So in part two, these young girls, okay, they're young, they're playing games and you can see them in the ballet. They're like walking around in circles and okay, whatever. But one of these girls, it gets, they get selected by fate. Fate. They're caught in this game, this like circle game they're playing on stage. They get caught in that circle twice. So obviously. Oh, oh, sir. Oh, well, goodbye, co-host. Fine, I guess it's just you and me. You know what, hold on. This is a perfect time for some tea. So obviously, this girl who gets caught in this circle game in the middle of the circle twice, she must be the chosen one, I guess. The other girls start dancing like, oh my gosh, we gotta start summoning our ancestors, and that's what happens there. And then the chosen girl, she, because she was selected by fate, she has to go with the wise elders, like who were in part one. This is gonna sound extreme when I say this, but this is the ballet. I did not write this, okay? You were the chosen one, so now we need to sacrifice you to the earth and uh, you will dance to your death. And then she does, and then the ballet is over. It's kind of intense. When you actually go to see the ballet though, it's not, gory or anything like that it's she's literally just dancing like a lot and also i want you to remember again this story is supposed to take place in a barbaric russian time this is not something that would happen in modern day you wouldn't ask someone all right dance to your death that wouldn't happen today so just keep that in mind this was supposed to take place in a different time have an open mind about this. So you're probably like, okay, Miss Brado, that's a really weird story you just told me. Thanks. Why, why was there, so, why was there a fight in the concert hall? That's not 
good concert etiquette. Okay, there's two reasons. Hold on. There's two reasons there was a fight in the concert hall. One, so when Stravinsky composed this music, it wasn't like you something you would hear in more classical times. Like you're thinking, oh, Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms and something that our ears are really accustomed to and like, oh yeah, that sounds like classical music. These were some chords that were very harsh and aggressive and there's actually a word for it when a chord doesn't sound good and it's like, ooh, that doesn't sound good together. The word is called dissonance. What are you doing? Hey, don't stop it. You're not a good co-host. Don't be a brat. Oh my gosh, such sass. Gosh, such a child. Anyways, what were they talking about? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a word for this. The word is called dissonance. So if something doesn't like, ooh, those notes when they're combined together, like that really doesn't sound good. The word is dissonance. That's what we use in music. It had like the music Stravinsky wrote had this harshness and in Western music, like in European music, it just wasn't heard that often. This was a relatively new concept. Today, if you heard some of these chords that were played back then, you'd be like, oh yeah, I've heard that before. You wouldn't have that reaction because it's not a new thing for you. But for the audience members who were sitting there at the premiere listening to this for the first time, they were like, what in the world did I just pay money for? This is awful because they had never experienced that before. Like it was that aggressive to their ears. They literally, couldn't handle it. Can you even imagine? Think about that for just a second. Can you even imagine listening to something for the first time and it is so new and crazy that you've had that type of reaction to it? Imagine that. Like, what would that sound like? Think about it. The second reason people went crazy over this is because in Paris, Ballet was like a big thing, still is. There were two groups of people when it came to ballet. First type of person was very traditional with their ballet. They were like, ballet is pretty and they wear tutus and their ballet shoes look really cute. That was the first camp. The traditional ones like this is the way ballet should be the second group they were kind of like the bohemian crowd in Paris they're like yes let's try some new like the artists let's try some new things let's see yeah that's super cool and new so they were more open to some new dance moves, I suppose, when it comes to ballet. The traditional group who went to go see Rite of Spring that evening, they were like, nope, no, I don't think so. This is not how ballet is supposed to be. And the reason they were so upset is because if you think of ballet, I am not a dancer never taken a dance class in my entire life. But if you imagine, like, imagine a ballerina or someone who's dancing ballet, everything is very open, there's like beautiful posture, they're thinking of their arms a lot and the line and everything's very long and graceful. That's kind of the traditional ballet style. It's beautiful and it's an art in itself, and it's very difficult to do, that traditional style. But the choreography that happened for this particular show was very different, because if you think of the music being aggressive and the story is about pagan Russia, like a barbaric type of Russian culture, not really like that, everything was very in. 
and very heavy. And so instead of this like beautiful line a ballerina would have, it was like, <clears throat> and that was not very well received. And then the other thing is, not only was it like these kind of jerky motions, it was, there was a lot of stomping. And even like, if you think of a ballerina's feet, like they have to be turned a certain way, even their feet were, instead of like having your feet like this, they were like turned in. It was really, it was really intense. I'm actually going to link a video below of the original choreography. So you can actually, and it's in two separate videos, but you can watch the original choreography for the Rite of Spring with the music. I actually, I love modern dance. So I actually really like it, but it doesn't look like ballet at all. So if you have never experienced something like this before with the music and the dance is just different, the audience had never experienced anything like this to the point that there was legit fighting. They were so angry. So if like, and this is what you're like, why would you fight over this? Because maybe there was one person who was a bohemian type who was like, oh yeah, let's experience this. This is something new. And then you have a traditionalist sitting right next to it. Like, how dare you say that? But maybe with like a more French accent. I don't know if I can do that accent. There is reports written that like made headlines in the newspaper in Paris. There was like hissing, there was booing, shouting, screaming, and there were some fist fights while the performance is going on. It's all because of the show, which is insane. And then the theater manager, even after the first part, he had to come on stage to like calm the audience down, be like, okay, look, we're in a performance. Remember you're in a ballet. Please be respectful. Please be quiet. People are trying to watch a show, yada, yada. And it didn't help. So it got so bad to where the police had to be called. Ow! The Paris Popo, the Parisian Popo. I don't know. So that's what happened. Eventually what happened was they kept doing the show. Like there were multiple showings of the show and it happened less and less. So the first premiere of it was intense and did not go well, but that's basically what happened. So that's the, I think one of the most famous things that happened to Stravinsky. Uh, later on after this happened, like uh, World War I started to come about and he found out that he was pretty isolated from his family in Russia because of it, which took a toll on him, which you can imagine. Um, after World War II, his wife and one of his daughters became very sick with tuberculosis. And then unfortunately, because tuberculosis is so contagious and terrible, they passed away. And then a few months later, his mom passed away. So it was just kind of not a great time for him, if you think about it. That's really sad. Um, and then after that, World War II started. And he was not only really overwhelmed by the loss of three family members really close together, um, but also the political situation in Europe. So he was like, I gotta get out of here, basically. And come to find out around the same time, uh, Harvard said, hey, uh, can you come to the United States and just like do some sessions, like conducting sessions and some seminars and stuff like that? Well, he was like, totally. So he flew to Boston and that's what he did for a little bit. Eventually he did remarry um, and he moved to Hollywood in California and he lived and he composed there for a while. That's where he kind of decided to stay for a very long time. Which brings me to my next story. So this is a, <laughs> this is a quicker story. 
but it's still something that happens because I love this story because it's literally the most awkward thing I've ever heard with a composer. So, and maybe this is more of a Rachmaninoff story, but Stravinsky is still involved. I'm gonna tell you it anyways. So, when Stravinsky was living in Hollywood, he and another composer, a very famous composer, Rachmaninoff, kind of arrived in Hollywood at around the same time. And Rachmaninoff um, and Stravinsky had different views on music. So Stravinsky kind of was a little bit more into modern music at the time. He liked trying new things and let's do this chord. And he was trying to push those boundaries a little bit. But Rachmaninoff didn't always agree with that. He was more of a... I don't want to say a full-on traditionalist, but he just wasn't super into modern music. Which is fine, because some of the compositions that Rachmaninoff produced are gorgeous. So, it's still okay. But Rachmaninoff, if you think about someone who has also had just come from Europe to Hollywood, California, he was like, I need friends. And he, <laughs> he like, really wanted to be friends with Stravinsky, which I think is hilarious. And he's like, I want to be friends with this guy so bad, but I'm kind of concerned because we don't share the same viewpoints on music. Like, what if he doesn't like me? Eventually what happened is Rachmaninoff uh, called him up. He's like, hey, Stravinsky, I'm Rachmaninoff. I came here. Can we get dinner sometime? Let's talk. Composer to composer. I don't, I don't know if that's what he said. But Stravinsky was like, yeah, totally, let's go get dinner. And so they have dinner, and Stravinsky had mentioned in this conversation over dinner that he, like, really liked honey, which is why I have honey here today. And I have no idea why and why they were talking about honey and the conversation, like, how did that evolve? I don't know. But Stravinsky said to Rachmaninoff, like, oh my gosh, I like love honey. And Rachmaninoff's like, I will remember that. Dude likes honey. So dinner ends, whatever. It was cordial. A few days go by. Stravinsky gets a knock on his door. And Stravinsky's like, who's at the door? He goes and answers the door. And it's Rachmaninoff with like this giant thing of honey, just like at the door, like, hi, I brought you honey. And Stravinsky's all like, and that's literally that story. I don't even know the rest of it. All I know is that that was the interaction with Rachmaninoff showing up to Stravinsky's door with like, I brought you honey. Oh my gosh, that's like really good honey. It's like floral. Good job, bees. Not bad. I actually don't like honey in my tea, like at all. I like it on other stuff, so I just do that. But can you imagine, like, the social skills of Rachmaninoff if that was what that was? Like, how awkward was that? And, like, I wish I were a fly on the wall just to see Stravinsky's reaction. Like, I mean, I can't imagine reacting to that if someone came to my door with a big bucket of honey. What do you do? What would you do? So that's what I have for today's episode. I'm going to be linking below the Firebird Ride of Spring. I'm just gonna do the one with the ballet so you can listen and watch at the same time. It's actually like, it's actually a pretty good ballet. Uh, Petrushka, and I'm also gonna attach Symphony in Three Movement, which was also a really big work that he did later on. That's it for today. My co-host is totally sleeping on the couch right now. He bailed on me, but I hope you have a wonderful day. Get some tea and watch this. And go listen to some Stravinsky. Have a great day. Bye. Uh, Petrushka. Petru.
You were literally like the worst co-host in the world. Sleeping on the job? Your job is to entertain.